Thank you. What a, what a pleasure to be here. What a great topic, the end of school. Yay. Uh, <laughs> I'm, a, uh, I'm an evolutionary psychologist, and what that means is that I'm interested in human nature. I'm interested in how that nature came about by biological evolution, by natural selection. I'm particularly interested in the nature of human children, and most particularly, in that aspect, those aspects of children's nature that lead them to become educated. So the big idea that I'm here to talk about is this, that children are biologically designed to educate themselves. They do it joyfully through play, questioning, and exploration. We don't need to educate children. All we need to do is to provide the conditions that would allow them to educate themselves. The basic instincts of childhood, their playfulness, their curiosity, their willfulness, their sociability, have been honed by natural selection to serve the function of education. But we take those abilities away when we put them in school and prevent them from educating themselves. My argument is that we, if we provide the conditions that children need to educate themselves, we really can do away with schools as we know them. Now, some of you, some of you might be thinking that I'm crazy. Some of you, more kindly, might be thinking that I'm a hopeless idealist. But I assure you, I am neither. I'm a hard-headed realist. I've done a great deal of research on this topic. The idea that I'm talking about today is supported by a great deal of empirical observation and research, which is elaborated upon in my book, but which here I have just a few minutes to try to convince you is worth uh, thinking about. The first way I want to think about this idea is by looking at hunter-gatherer cultures. Now, we were all hunter-gatherers until relatively recently in history from a biological point of view. Some people in certain isolated parts of the world have survived as hunter-gatherers into modern times, and anthropologists have found them and studied their cultures. A few years ago, a graduate student of mine and I conducted a survey of 10 different anthropologists who had studied seven different hunter-gatherer cultures among them on three different continents. We asked them questions about how children became educated in that culture. One of our questions was, how much time do children in the culture that you observed have to play and explore on their own? And the answer that we got from every single one of these anthropologists was all the time. The children and even the teenagers are free to play and explore in age-mixed groups away from adults all day long, every day, and in the process they become educated. Another question we asked was, how do they play? What are the forms of their play? And what we found from that, from, from these uh, anthropologists, was that they play at the very activities that are hardest to learn and are most important to learn for success in their culture. So they play at hunting and gathering and finding roots and digging them up. They play at building things like huts and dugout canoes and bows and arrows and musical instruments. They play at the music and dance and art of their culture. They play at those things that they have to learn to become educated. The anthropologists also told us, and I've seen it in writing many times, that they have never seen brighter, happier, more resilient, more self-reliant children than the hunter-gatherer children that they observe. So the question is, could this work in our culture? At first gloss, you might think, of course it can't. <laughs> you know, we're not hunter-gatherers. There are things that we have to learn that hunter-gatherer children don't have to learn, like reading, writing, and arithmetic. And moreover, it's not so easy for children in our culture to be exposed naturally to all the skills and, and knowledge that's important to the culture. So I might think that it wouldn't work except for the fact that for many years now I've been an observer 
and researcher at the Sudbury Valley School in Framingham, Massachusetts. This school was founded in 1968, so it's now been in existence for almost half a century. It has about 150 students at any given time, age four on through about 18. It has uh, about eight staff members, adult staff members. It operates on a budget that's about half of what the local public schools cost. And it accepts essentially all students who apply. There's, so this is not elite education. This is eminently affordable. Now, the unique things about this school are the way it is administered and the educational philosophy of the school. The school is, is, operates as a, uh, as a participatory democracy. All of the school rules are made by a school meeting at which each student and each staff member has one vote, and the rules are enforced at a judicial committee by a judicial committee which is modeled after the jury system of our larger culture. At any given time, there's one little kid, one middle-sized kid, a couple of teenagers, and one staff member on the judicial committee, and if somebody, whether it's a staff member or a student, violates a rule at the school, they're brought up before the judicial committee, which makes a decision about guilt or innocence and a decision about uh, what the punishment might be if, if found guilty. So that's the way the school operates. In terms of the educational philosophy, it's essentially the same as that of a hunter-gatherer band. The school offers no curriculum, no tests, no grades, no substitutes for grades. It expects children to decide themselves what they want to learn, how they want to learn, what they want to do. If you were to go through the school at any given time of day, you might see scenes such as on this slide. You would see children in the art room making, making various kinds of art projects. You'd, you might find somebody cooking in the kitchen. You would always find some people in the computer lab. You might find somebody in the photo lab. You might find children building with blocks in the children's playroom, children playing music in one of the music practice rooms, kids drawing playfully at a blackboard, children, young people maybe playing a game such as chess. Outdoors, you might find people playing down by the brook or climbing boulders or fishing in the pond or playing a game on the athletic field or strumming a guitar and talking and singing. In the winter, you might find people building a snowman or skating on that pond that they fished in in the fall. You might also see them playing in more traditional playground uh, ways. The key to learning at this school is age mixing. The children are not segregated by age. The older children are naturally drawn to the little kids and the little kids are naturally drawn to the big kids. The little children observe what the older ones can do and they want to do that. They want to be able to read if they see older ones read. They want to be able to climb trees if they see older ones climb trees. They also learn by interacting with the older ones. In age-mixed games, the older children are constantly scaffolding the behavior of the younger ones, bringing them up to higher levels of performance. So, for example, many children at this school learn to read because they play games that involve reading with kids who know how to read. And the kids who know how to read more or less teach them to read, not because they're trying to teach them to read, but because they almost need to do so to play the game. The advantage of age mixing also goes the other way. The older children are learning to care and be nurturant, to be leaders by helping the younger ones in this setting. And they're also being continuously inspired by the creativity and the energy of the younger ones. So the age mixing is, at, is as valuable for the older kids as for the younger ones. The best evidence that this school works comes from follow-up studies for the graduates. Quite a number of years ago, I, along with a colleague, David Chanoff, conducted one such study. We found essentially all of the people who had graduated from that school, almost all of them agreed to be in the study. And what we found was that they were doing very well out there in the world. They, were, they had no problems in higher education if they chose to go that way. 
and they were in a wide variety of careers. They were essentially, all of them, very satisfied with their lives. Many of them, and this is really interesting to me, many of them were pursuing careers that were direct extensions of passions and interests that they had developed in childhood play. So for example, one of the graduates was a machinist and an inventor. He was somebody who loved to build things as a kid. There was another who loved boats, who was now the captain of a cruise ship. There was another who, uh, who, who was fascinated by computers, loved computers, who had developed his own software company. There was another who loved making doll clothes, who is now a pattern maker in the high fashion industry. And I could go on and on with such examples. People who have time to really pursue what they like to play at could find ways of making a living at that. So on through the rest of their life, they were doing what they were really interested in doing. Since uh, the time of my study, a couple of uh, other studies of the school have been conducted by staff members of the school, Daniel Greenberg and Mimsy Sadovsky, and have been published as books. And they came to essentially the same conclusion uh, as we did. The Sudbury model is replicable. More than three dozen schools modeled after it exists, mostly in this country, some in other countries. Um, <clears throat> that one of the closest to, to here is the, in fact, the closest to here is the Tallgrass Sudbury School in, uh, in Riverside, Illinois. Success at these schools, as far as I can have been able to tell, doesn't seem to depend on socio and economic class. It doesn't seem to depend on the particulars of the student's personality. Now here I want to describe the conditions that I think are common to a hunter-gatherer band and the Sudbury Valley School and that really are the conditions that optimize children's abilities to educate themselves. So the first condition is a clear understanding that education is the child's responsibility. When children know that they're responsible for their education, they take that responsibility. When they believe, they're led to believe that somebody else is responsible for their education and all they have to do is do what they're told, then they tend to do that in the minimal way and they don't take responsibility for their education. Second condition, unlimited opportunity to play, explore, and pursue your own interests. Unlimited time, not an hour a day, not two hours a day, unlimited time. It takes time to try out different things. It takes time to get bored, to overcome boredom, to find your passion, and it takes time to become to really delve into your passion. It takes unlimited amount of time. You can't interrupt that with bells and telling people constantly what to do and expect people to really develop a passion. Three, opportunity to play with the tools of the culture, to really play with the tools of the culture. In a hunter-gatherer culture, those would be bows and arrows and knives and fire and digging sticks. In our culture, of course, the main tool is a computer. And it's not surprising that children everywhere in our culture love to play with computers. They know in their bones that this is the tool of the culture and they need to spend a lot of time with it. So it becomes, in a sense, an extension of their own body. Access to a variety of caring adults who are helpers, not judges. How important that last part is, helpers, not judges. The last person you want to go to to help you learn something is somebody who's evaluating you. You're nervous about that person. That person is a person you go to in, in more of a, a, of a frame of mind of trying to impress that person with how much you know, not to say, I really don't know this and I would like some help with this. So by, by not judging the children, the staff members are much more able to be helpers to the children than teachers in a typical school could be. Free age mixing among children and adolescents, I've already described that. That's absolutely key to the school. The school would not work if it were children all the same age because children don't have much to learn from others who are the same age. They learn from children who are older and from children who are younger than themselves. Six, immersion in a stable, moral, democratic community. Both 
a hunter-gatherer band in the Sudbury Valley School are in their own different ways democratic communities. They're communities in which every child knows that their ideas and their actions influence the others involved in the community. So they're growing up in a setting where they feel responsible not just for themselves, but for the community within which they are developing. And that is an extraordinarily important aspect of education and one which is almost completely ignored in our regular schools. Now what I want you to notice is that none of these conditions exist in our standard schools, none of them. It's as if we deliberately take away from children everything that they need to educate themselves when we put them in school. And then we try very inefficiently and very ineffectively to educate them. So I'm going to conclude this way. I'm absolutely sure that someday people are going to look back at us now and they're going to say, what were those people thinking? Why on earth did they ever believe that coercion is essential for education? That's like believing you have to force people to eat or you have to force people to breathe. Why on earth did they ever think that standardization, such that people, regardless of their interests, regardless of their predilections, should all learn the same thing in the same way, be tested by the same tests? What kind of a crazy idea is that? I'm sure that we will reach the day where people will look back and say that. I hope we reach that day sooner rather than later. I would like to see it come in my lifetime. And I hope that some of you, maybe really all of you, I hope, will play a role in bringing that time about before too long. And with that, I thank you for your kind attention. I thank you for being here. And bless you all. If you ask just about any SVS student what they're going to do today, uh, chances are you're not going to get a very articulate answer. Maybe because they don't want to talk to you, but it's probably because uh, they don't know. But if you ask them like what you're interested in, I mean, that's, that's a whole different story. You'll probably get a very, very articulate answer. And a student not knowing exactly what they're going to do, but knowing what they like just going to immerse themselves in whatever interest that they have, whatever activity. It's a beautiful campus. It is soothing to come into. I feel like when you pull into the parking lot at school, it's just kind of escaping into our own little world where we can do whatever we want. We can do what we need to do without people interfering with that. You see how many green cards we have? I gave yeah, you all like, of mine. We have like 20. There's lots of different types of kids who come to Sudbury Valley School. Some have been here their whole lives. Some have just been here a couple of years. I spent four years at Sudbury Valley. And in my thesis, I like split up those four years um, into a different section because each one I had like a, a uniquely different um, learning experience and I had a like a higher order of thinking every every successive year. In my first year I really spent most of that year just playing video games. One particular video game actually. A lot of parents and a lot of people who don't know the Sudbury model like ask me like well 
don't kids just play video games all day? And like, well, what if my kid just plays video games all day? And uh, I mean, that's that's exactly what I did, and I certainly have no regrets. I did have a, a pretty close knit group of friends who all shared the same exact interests as I did, and uh, we were intensely involved in that community. I mean, it was. It was just like anything else that you would be really intensely involved in. It just happened to be video games for us. How do you control it? Um, oh, here you go. How will you ever survive? They're all just a lot of death. <laughs> They're just evil bounty balls. One. Okay, I found a safe spot. I actually gotta fix this glitch. Yeah, well, in a couple couple minutes, you'll be blown away by my programming prowess. We studied those video games just like an economist would, would study the stock market. And I think anything that you put effort into, that type of effort into, would yield some growth in any manifestation. A couple of years ago at the picnic, I got together a five-on-five -five basketball game just because we had a lot of players here and it just seemed like a good idea. And after that was done, I realized I had a lot of fun. So when the school year started up, I just decided to start up my own basketball tournament. Hey guys, there's 10 seconds left. No one is forced to play. If you want to play, then we all have a great time. And there's little kids and there's big kids and there's medium-sized kids. We really try and make it as fair as possible. Athletics of the school take a big part in more than just my life. People are running around, playing tag, playing sports, throwing around in frisbee, swinging. I mean, when it's sunny and it's nice outside, you see people running around. And when it's raining outside and there's snow on the ground, we still play basketball at school. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, Could someone make a video? Press the center button and start filming. What? Press what? Center button. Okay. Is it filming? Yeah. Alright, point at me. Hey. There's escalator rock, there's either lunge rock, turtle rock, and there's another name for it, but I forget. Staircase rock. Just what are you doing? Climbing. Are you getting up this way? Yes, it's fun. Give me a challenge. This is more challenging. <clears throat> yeah. What? That? Yeah. It's good. I think it's possible. Getting, yeah, well, everything's possible. Yeah. Before coming to Sudbury Valley School, I'd played guitar. It was a, a growing interest in the background. And then the summer after the first year, I spent some time at um, Berkeley College of Music in a, in a guitar program. And it was like I had used my ears for the first time. In my second year, I was spending lots more time rehearsing for the SVS music productions that we put on a couple of times a year. And I was focusing a lot on that, on that stuff. And it, shifted from that all video games to almost almost all music throughout that year and that was that was my major focus. I really like being able to focus on something that really takes my interest and having as much time as I want really to focus on it or not focus on it if I'm not interested. Upside down. Good. Put something in there. Whatever color you want. I'm gonna mix colors. Can you mix it in here? Go ahead. They actually took away my art program at my old school, and I couldn't get through the day without art, and now I can do it all day, and I have the freedom to do it, and to explore different mediums and explore different techniques. And I think that's really important in anything you do, to have that sort of freedom. It's stuck there. I think it's good, Elizabeth. I think um, what I'm going to do is hook you and June together at this point, because I just wanted to make sure that you were solid with the song, that you're solid. And I, she knows the piano part. Yeah. So now the two of you will put together an awesome band. Cool. I mostly play classical music. This year I've been focusing on Debussy, Haydn, and now I'm working on a Chopin piece. 
the moment I've got most of it roughed in, but I'm just working on this new section that I haven't really looked at before. I love having the pianos here at school because I can play just about whenever I want. There's a second piano up in the barn, so if this one's busy, I've always got another one. So I can practice for three hours a day if I want to. I mean, seriously, that monster is not big, but it's actually amazingly scary. The thing that I like about making the movies is that I like the when you're done and you get to watch it and say that you made that movie. The scene that I'm working on is about where the major gets taken captive by the humongous and is put in with all the other little kids that were taken by the humongous. Well, it first started out as a box, obviously. Um, then we got some foam pieces. We, what did we, Aaron, what did we do to stick these on? Duct tape them on. And then we got ex um, expanding foam and then had it as a snow monster. And then we spray painted it for the spring monster. Yesterday, I, when I was filming, I had 15 kids up here. And at times, that was chaotic. We're six days into filming, and we have three days left. This is a fundraiser for the Music Corp. All the money that we're raising goes to the Music Corp to help buy instruments and supplies so we can play more music at the school. I know. What? Go, pickle. I'm getting one meal, so yes, I am getting a pickle. One. Does anyone here want an extra pickle? Take the pickle then. Yeah. I don't like pickles. I love pickles. I hate pickles. I love them. How do you hate pickles? <laughs> These pickles are awesome! The Music Corp is a bunch of people who like music, so they have meetings, and you can be a director, so you get to vote on stuff for the Music Corp for what they buy, and they have meetings whenever they want to decide something important that has to do with musical instruments or fundraising or something like that. The shows happen four times a year and people start getting ready for them since like the last show. People start rehearsing and practicing and deciding what songs they want. I'm usually in the shows every year and it's a lot of fun to be in them and see everybody and usually the whole school goes to them. My third year was it was a little bit of a contrast to the to the first two and that I was in the first two I had like a hobby that I was I was doing all the time. I was always busy with that. Um, and then my third year, I spent a lot more time in the sewing room, which is a particular room of Sudbury Valley School that sees like the most amount of traffic, the most amount of conversation. It's a very, very crazy place. And I spent a lot of time in there just conversing and observing and listening to all these types of things being talked about. My most critical thinking was done during that year. I spent a lot of time just writing essays because I had talked so much uh, in the sewing room. We had so many both strange and intense uh, conversations. There was a lot of things that I, I wanted to not forget, <laughs> a lot of quotes from the day. And at first I was, I was just like jotting them down and then eventually I was writing full essays um, in an effort to not, to not lose any of the stuff that I thought was productive. Well, towards the end of my third year, I came to a couple of conclusions and I realized that while I absolutely love music, um, that I wouldn't make a career out of it. And I had sort of an intense, absolute passion for, for cognitive sciences and neuroscience, which came out of, of thinking about how we perceive music and how, you know, how music is such a fundamental aspect of you know, our cognitive processes. And more and more I decided that I was going to need to work up to a traditional like, college education to be able to go into this field. I call my fourth year like my adult year. I worked full-time job as a computer technician, but I also spent a lot of time formulating the plans and putting together like what I would have to do, what I'd have to accomplish to be able to, to get accepted by a university. There's a quality about Sudbury Valley School kids that whether they like it or not, they're absolutely unique. Uh, they have a really, really unique educational background. The school gave me the gift of time to let my own interests rise to the surface. 
When you sit down to paint, you don't just sit and paint. You have to think about what you're doing and why. Any creative effort, perhaps any effort at all, requires a great deal of thought, even reading a book. You don't just read a book, you think about what you read, otherwise you're doing it for nothing. The school gave us the gift of time to relax, to have those things come to the surface that were there. It gave us time for reflection, for the introspection that you need to really develop your own creativity. I think that's a remarkable thing. I'll call this school meeting to order. Everyone could please first turn off your cell phones and direct your attention to the results of previous school meetings. As the chairman of the school meeting, I am essentially the chief executive officer of the school, which means that I do a lot of things from signing staff contracts and also I'm ex officio on a lot of the important committees, which means that I run a lot of them. I'm automatically, as chairman, a member of those. So things like managing the budget or dealing with staffing and admissions. I also run the weekly school meetings and kind of just help to manage the day-to-day -day school affairs. Is there any discussion? If not, we'll vote. All in favor? All opposed? Motion passes. The school meeting is extremely important because it's basically what runs the school. Everything is decided in the school meeting. And, you know, we've delegated to the JC to deal with judicial matters, and we've delegated to certain clerks and committees to deal with things. But ultimately, school meeting is the authority. Everyone that comes to the school is a school meeting member. Everyone has an equal vote. And I feel like the community of the school really teaches kids that they, you know, they're just as equal as any other person here. And I think that translates in the school meeting. It doesn't matter if you're 4 or 16 or 75, everyone gets one vote. Everyone gets to talk. And we're all equals and we make the decisions together by majority vote. The world and the school is constantly changing and evolving and we do modify rules every now and then. And sometimes when we change one, we'll realize that that didn't quite work out and we'll go back and, you know, amend it or fix it. And uh, sometimes we realize there's, you know, new issues in the world that, you know, need tending to. We think about everything and we discuss everything and we debate everything. And if we didn't have the structure that we have of having two motions, a well-run school meeting where everyone gets their voice heard, the decisions that we made would not be as good. So at every school meeting, we have an agenda like this, and it has everything that you know we plan to discuss, every item of business. Can we have a report from the clerks? Francis. We have five finished, zero new, and zero work in progress. So we are now discussing regular JC business, which usually takes about the bulk of school meeting. So the school meeting reviews all the reports and sentences and charges that the JC decided on and sometimes they decide to change things, sometimes they don't. And we also deal with anything that has been referred to the school meeting. So that's usually more serious cases that the JC has decided they can't handle within their power. And then we move on to second readings, which is motions that we'll be voting on that day. And then written agenda, which is motions that were just put in, so we kind of discuss those and throw them back and forth. And then we'll vote on them next week. And then there's open agenda, which, you know, if there's an issue that wasn't in the written agenda, anybody can bring up. So you can say pretty much anything on the floor. And when that's over, we're adjourned. It's exciting and it's interesting. But the reason that it's the most interesting to me is because I really care what's going on in school. I mean, a lot of people, when there's something going on in JC that they think is important, will go to JC. And the same thing with school meeting. And I think it's really, really great because I learned a lot from being JC clerk and I am learning a lot from being school meeting chairman and the whole process is one of the things that people benefit most from this school. Is there any discussion of the results?
ask her. I will get one. All right, we have Isabella. Stand over there. So Danny brought you up in the office yesterday. Isabella was screaming in the office and hall and screamed at me when I told her to calm down. Oh. What happened? Okay. I was in the office talking to The JC is a group of kids and staff from the school, and we deal with when people break rules. And basically how the JC works is that if you see someone breaking a rule or they do something to you that you don't like, you can write a complaint, and then the JC reviews them, investigates them, and figure out kind of what happened and whether they broke a rule or not. It's kind of like jury duty in a way. You're chosen, you've got to show up on your day, 11 o'clock, you got to stay there through the whole thing. You get a vote, you get to sit there. And we have a staff that joins us, and together we all decide. We all make the decision. We all make the choice of what the people are going to get as their charge, as their sentence, and it all works out. All in favor? I'll oppose report Motion passes. passes. All right, you want to call Sam in here? Nope. The way they made that is just, I think, genius. I mean, you get all kinds of perspectives from a little kid that might see only certain parts of the problem uh, all the way up to a staff member who might see beyond the problem or someone my age who might even understand my reasoning uh, more so than other people. I mean, the best part about it is that it's not just a kid my age uh, just saying, look, he's my friend, so I'm going to let him off. I mean, it's all these ideas coming together and making a, a final judgment. We have a lot of different rules, and most of them are basically common sense. But um, one of the biggest ones and one of the first ones we made was called infringement, which is basically that everyone has a right to you know, go about their day peacefully and be able to pursue what they want to pursue without people harassing them or being mean to them. So it's basically that you can't do anything to anybody that they don't want you to do. It's very nice to have this feeling in the community that if someone is bugging you or doing something you don't like, that you don't have to put up with it or you don't need to get an adult. You can say, stop or I'll bring you up. Well, when somebody writes a complaint, there's a line and they write witnesses. And so before we even call anybody in, the complainant, who's the person who wrote the complaint, or the person that they're writing the complaint against, we sort of talk about it as a JC and decide whether we want to talk to the person who wrote the complaint first, or maybe get one of the witnesses, sort of like, you know, a bystander that wasn't really involved, especially if it's a complaint which, you know, might be, well, so-and-so did this to me, but maybe he was provoked and the complaint doesn't say that. And you get to hear it from all sides and figure out really what happened from from everybody, not just the people who were involved. And from that, you'll, you'll write a report that goes with the testimony. You could write in it what people specifically said, what they didn't. Back in uh, public high school, you know, you do something, and even if the principal might feel like you didn't necessarily do such a bad thing, sometimes he would stick to the rule book and even give you a really bad, uh, I don't know, a uh, weekend of coming to school or something like that when you were just like five minutes late to, to class or something. Here, for example, if you break a rule even though there's no rule like that, you get to voice your opinion and whoever wrote the complaint gets to voice their opinion. They get to actually uh, come to a fair conclusion. I mean, you might have still broken a rule so you will get a punishment, uh, but it might not be as severe, it might not be uh, you know, a, a strict, already set out rule book for that. So, I mean, that's just the, the best thing you could really ever ask for, I think, uh, for being a, a person my age or even a little kid, you know? So, uh, I definitely love that part about school and I respect it a lot. I think there's definitely a satisfaction in, for me, working towards what the truth is, how you're going to get at it, how you're going to figure it out. And once you're done with it, it's an awesome feeling. I think that the school's really cool, and I think it's really cool how people are allowed to have a say in stuff. Because the person who got brought up and the person who wrote the complaint, they both get to say what happened, and then they get to agree if they think that's fair or not. I think one of the keys is that it's a government by the peers. And I think that's one of the things that really hits home with people. It's your friends and the people that you see every day and want to spend time with who are saying, hey, don't do that. I like you, but you really can't do that here. 
and you can't do it in your life. Hey, Nell, could you stand over there behind David? Thanks. Um, there was a Hershey's candy bar wrapper littered yesterday with the initials E.D. Okay. Do you ever get things initials E.D. or is it always We ND? are very clear about our procedures and everyone knows them from the minute they come into the JC for the first time. It's explained to them, younger kids and older kids. And, you know, a six-year-old is going to understand how to deal with something on a procedural level. You know, they say this is how it's done and this is the procedure and this is what order everything's going to happen in. And they understand both, you know, in the JC and in the school meeting. And if they're going to go into something like that in life after leaving school or while they're still at school, they're really going to understand that there is a procedure and that they have to follow it and how to follow it. It's explained to them. I think one of the things that sums it up is one of our most important rules is preamble, which says that all school meeting members are responsible for protecting the atmosphere of the school, which is of freedom and trust and fairness and order. That is just how we exist in school. We have a lot of rules, we really do. But all the rules are there to make sure that everyone can exist freely. What is going to be the future of learning? I do have a plan, but in order for me to tell you what that plan is, um, I need to tell you a little story which kind of sets the stage. I tried to look at where did uh, the kind of learning we do in schools, where did it come from? And, you know, you can look far back into the past, but if you look at present-day schooling the way it is, it's quite easy to figure out where it came from. It came from about 300 years ago. And it came from the last and the biggest of the empires on this planet. Imagine trying to run the show, trying to run the entire planet without computers, without telephones, with data handwritten on pieces of paper and traveling by ships. But the Victorians actually did it. What they did was amazing. They created a global computer made up of people. It's still with us today. It's called the Bureaucratic Administrative Machine. <laughs> In order to have that machine running, you need lots and lots of people. They made another machine to produce those people the school. The schools would produce the people who would then become parts of the bureaucratic administrative machine. They must be identical to each other. They must know three things. They must have good handwriting, because the data is handwritten. They must be able to read, and they must be able to do multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction in their head. They must be so identical that you could pick one up from New Zealand and ship them to Canada, and he would be instantly functional. The Victorians were great engineers. They engineered a system that was so robust that it's still with us today. Continuously producing identical people for a machine that no longer exists. The empire is gone. So what are we doing with that design that produces these identical people? And what are we going to do next, if we ever are going to do anything else with it? So that's a pretty strong comment there. I said, schools as we know them now, they're obsolete. I'm not saying they're broken. It's quite fashionable to say that the education system is broken. It's not broken. It's wonderfully constructed. It's just that we don't need it anymore. It's outdated. What's the kind of jobs that we have today? Well, the clerks are the computers. They're there in thousands in every office. And you have people who guide those computers to do their clerical jobs. 
those people don't need to be able to write beautifully by hand. They don't need to be able to multiply numbers in their heads. They do need to be able to read. In fact, they need to be able to read discerningly. But that's today. But we don't even know what the jobs of the future are going to look like. We know that people will work from wherever they want, whenever they want, in whatever way they want. How is present-day schooling going to prepare them for that world? Well, I bumped into this whole thing completely by accident. I used to teach people how to write computer programs in New Delhi 14 years ago. And right next to where I used to work, there was a slum. And I used to think, how, how on earth are those kids ever going to learn to write computer programs? Or are they, should they not? At the same time, we also had lots of parents, rich people, who had computers, and who used to tell me, you know, my son, um, I think he's gifted because, you know, he does wonderful things with computers. And my daughter, oh, surely she, she's, you know, extra intelligent and so on. So I suddenly figured that how come all the rich people are having these extraordinary gifted children? <laughs> <laughs> what did the poor do wrong? <laughs> I made a hole in the, in the boundary wall of the slum next to my office and I stuck a computer inside it just to see what would happen if I gave a computer to children who never would have one, didn't know any English, didn't know what the internet was. The children came running in, it was three feet off the ground, and they said, what is this? And I said, yeah, but it's, uh, you know, I don't know. So but they, <laughs> <laughs> they said, um, why have you put it there? I said, just like that. And they said, can we touch it? I said, if you wish to. And I went away. About eight hours later, we found them browsing and teaching each other how to browse. So I said, but that's impossible. Because, you know, how, how is it possible? They, they don't know anything. My colleagues said, no, it's a simple solution. One of your students must have been passing by, showed them how to use the mouse. So I said, yeah, that's possible. So I repeated the experiment. I went 300 miles out of Delhi into a really remote village where the chances of a, you know, a passing software development engineer <laughs> were, was, was, was very little. <laughs> I repeated the experiment there. There was no place to stay, so I stuck my computer in, I went away, came back after a couple of months, found kids playing games on it. When they saw me, they said, we want a faster processor and a better mouse. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said, how on earth do you know all this? And they said something very interesting to me. In an irritated voice, they said, you've given us a machine that works only in English, so we had to teach ourselves English in order to use it. <laughs> I, that's the first time as a teacher that I heard the word teach ourselves said so casually. Here's a, here's a short glimpse from those years. That's the first day at the hole in the wall. On your right is an eight-year-old. Um, to his left is his uh, student. Um, uh, she is six. And uh, he's teaching her how to browse. Then on to the... Uh, you know, other parts of the country, I repeated this over and over again, getting exactly the same results everywhere. An eight-year-old telling his elder sister what to do. <laughs> and finally, a girl explaining in Marathi what it is, and said, there's a processor inside. So I started publishing. I published everywhere. I wrote down and measured everything. And I said, in nine months, a group of children left alone with a computer in any language would reach the same standard as an office secretary in the West. I'd seen it happen over and over and over again. But I was curious to know what else would they do if they could do this much. So I started experimenting with other subjects. Among them, for example, pronunciation. There's one community of children in southern India whose English pronunciation was really bad. And they needed good pronunciation because that would improve their jobs. I gave them a speech-to-text engine in a computer. And I said, keep talking into it until it types what you say. Okay. <laughs> they did that. And watched a little bit of this. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. 
the, the reason I end it with that, uh, the face of this uh, young lady over there is because uh, I suspect many of you know her. She's now uh, uh, joined the call center in Hyderabad and may have tortured you about your credit card bills. <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in a very clear English accent. <laughs> so then people said, well, how far will it go? Where does it stop? I decided I would, I would destroy my own argument by creating an absurd proposition. I made a hypothesis, a ridiculous hypothesis. Tamil is a South Indian language, and I said, can Tamil-speaking children in a South Indian village learn the biotechnology of DNA replication in English from a street-side computer? And I said, I'll measure them, they'll get a zero, I'll spend a couple of months, I'll leave it for a couple of months, I'll go back, they'll get another zero, I'll go back to the lab and say, we need teachers. I found a village, it was called Kali Kuppam in southern India. Uh, I put in hole in the wall computers there, downloaded all kinds of stuff from the internet about DNA replication, most of which I didn't understand. <laughs> I, the children came rushing and said, what's all this? So I said, um, it's very topical, very important, it's all in English. So they said, how can we understand such big English words and you know, diagrams and chemistry? So by now, I had developed a new pedagogical method, so I applied that. I said, I haven't the foggiest idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, and anyway, I'm going away. <laughs> so I, I left them for a couple of months. They had got a zero, I gave them a test. I came back after two months and the children trooped in and said, we've understood nothing. So I said, well, I mean, what did I expect? So I said, OK, but um, how long did it take you before you decided that you can't understand anything? So they said, we haven't given up. We look at it every single day. So I said, what? You don't understand these screens, and you keep staring at it for two months. What for? So a little girl, who, who you'll see just now, she raised her hand, and she says to me in broken Tamil and English, she said, well, apart from the fact that improper replication of the DNA molecule causes disease, we haven't understood anything else. <laughs> so, I tested them. I got an educational impossibility, 0 to 30% in two months in the tropical heat under, with a computer under the tree in a language that they didn't know, doing something that's a decade ahead of their time. Absurd. But, but I had to follow the Victorian norm. 30% is a fail. <laughs> How do I get them to pass? I have to get them 20 more marks. I couldn't find a teacher. What I did find was a friend that they had, a 22-year-old girl who was an accountant, and she played with them all the time. So I asked this girl, can you help them? So she says, uh, absolutely not. I, I, didn't, I didn't have science in school. I have no idea what they're doing under that tree all day long. I, I, I can't help you. I said, um, I'll tell you what, use the method of the grandmother. So she says, what's that? I said, stand behind them. Whenever they do anything, you just say, well, wow, I mean, how did you do that? What's the next page? Gosh, when I was your age, I could have never done that. I mean, you know what grannies do. So <laughs> she did that for two more months. The scores jumped to 50%. Kali Kuppam had caught up with my control school in New Delhi, a rich private school with a trained biotechnology teacher. When I saw that graph, I knew there is a way to level the playing field. Here's Kali mm. Kuppam. I got the camera angle wrong in that, that one, it's just amateur stuff, but what she was saying, uh, as you could make out, was about neurons, but her hands were like that, and she was saying, neurons communicate at 12. So, what are jobs going to be like? Well, we know what they're like today. What's learning going to be like? We know what it's like today, children poring over with their mobile phones on the one hand, and then reluctantly going to school to, to pick up their books with the other hand. Um, what will it be tomorrow? Could it be that we don't need to go to school at all? Could it be that at the point in time when you need to know something, you can find out in two minutes? Could it be a devastating question, a question that was framed for me by Nicholas Negroponte? Could it be that we are heading towards, or maybe in, a future 
when knowing is obsolete. But that's terrible. We are homo sapiens. Knowing, that's, that's, that's what distinguishes us from the apes. But look at it this way. It took nature 100 million years to make the ape stand up and become homo sapiens. It took us only 10,000 to make knowing obsolete. What an achievement that is. But we have to integrate that into our own future. Encouragement seems to be the key. If you look at Kuppam, if you look at all of the experiments that I did, it was simply saying, wow, saluting learning. There is evidence from neuroscience. The reptilian part of our brain, which sits in the center of our brain, when it's threatened, it shuts down everything else. It shuts down the prefrontal cortex, the parts which learn. It shuts all of that down. Punishment and examinations are seen as threats. We take our children, we make them shut their brains down, and then we say, perform. Why did they create a system like that? Because it was needed. There was an age in the age of empires when you needed those people who can survive under threat. When you're standing in a trench all alone, if you could have survived, you're OK. You passed. If you didn't, you failed. But the age of empires is gone. What happens to creativity in our age? We need to shift that balance back from threat to pleasure. I came back to England looking for British grandmothers. I put out notices in papers saying, if you're a British grandmother, if you have broadband and a web camera, can you give me one hour of your time per week for free? I got 200 in the first two weeks. I know more British grandmothers than anyone in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> They're called the granny cloud. The granny cloud sits on the internet. If there's a child in, in trouble, we beam a gran. She goes, over, she goes on over Skype, and she sorts things out. I've seen them do it from a village called Diggles in uh, northwestern England, uh, deep inside a village in Tamil Nadu, India, 6,000 miles away. She does it with only one age-old gesture. <laughs> okay. Watch this. You can't catch me. You say it. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. Well done, very good. <laughs> so what's happening here? I think what we need to look at is we need to look at learning as the product of educational self-organization. If you allow the educational process to self-organize, then learning emerges. It's not about making learning happen, it's about letting it happen. The teacher sets the, the process in motion, and then she stands back in awe and watches as learning happens. I think that's what all this is pointing at. But how will we know? How will we come to know? Well, I intend to build these self-organized learning environments. They are basically broadband, collaboration, and encouragement put together. I've tried this in many, many schools. It's been tried all over the world. And teachers sort of uh, stand back and say, it just happens by itself? And I said, yeah, it happens by itself. How did you know that? And I said, uh, you won't believe the children who told me and where they're from. Here's a soul in action. This one is in England. Uh, he maintains law and order. Because remember, there's no teacher around. Australia. Giving it a net positive or negative electrical charge. The net charge on an ion is equal to the number of protons in the I have minus the number of a decade ahead of a time. So souls, I think we need a curriculum of big questions. You already heard about that. You know what, what that means. 
There was a time when Stone Age men and women used to sit and look up at the sky and say, what are those twinkling lights? They built the first curriculum. But we've lost sight of that wondrous question. We brought it down to the tangent of an angle. But that's not, that, that's not sexy enough. The way you would put it to a nine-year-old is to say, if a meteorite was coming to hit the Earth, how would you figure out if it was going to or not? And if he says, well, what, how? You say there's a magic word, it's called the tangent of an angle, and leave him alone, he'll figure it out. So here are a couple of images from souls. I've tried incredible, incredible questions. Um, when did the world begin? Uh, how will it end? To nine-year-olds. Yeah, this one's about what happens to the air we breathe. This is done by children without the help of any teacher. The teacher only raises the question and then stands back and admires the answer. So, what's my wish? My wish is that we design the future of learning. We don't want to be spare parts for a great human computer, do we? So we need to design a future for learning. And I've got to, hang on, I've got to get this wording exactly right, because, you know, it's very important. My wish is to help design a future of learning by supporting children all over the world to tap into their wonder and their ability to work together. Help me build this school. It will be called the School in the Cloud. It will be a school where children go on these intellectual adventures, driven by the big questions which their mediators put in. The way I want to do this is to build a facility where I can study this. It's a facility which is practically unmanned. There's only one granny who manages health and safety. The rest of it's from the cloud. The lights are turned on and off by the cloud, etc., etc. Everything's done from the cloud. But I want you for another purpose. You can do self-organized learning environments at home, in the school, outside of school, in clubs. It's very easy to do. There's a great document produced by Ted which tells you how to do it. If you would please, please do it across all five continents, and send me the data. Then I'll put it all together, move it into the School of Clouds, and create the future of learning. That's my wish. And just one last thing. I'll take you to the top of the Himalayas. At 12,000 feet, where the air is thin, I once built two hole-in-the-wall computers. And the children flocked there. And there was this little girl who was following me around. And I said to her, you know, I want to, I want to give a computer to everybody every child. I don't know, what should I do? And I was trying to take a picture of her, you know, quietly. She suddenly raised her hand like this and said to me, get on with it. <laughs> I think it was good advice. I'll follow her advice, I'll stop talking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Khan Academy is most known for its, its collection of videos, so before I go any farther, uh, let, let me show you a little bit of a, a montage. So the hypotenuse is now going to be five. This animal's fossils are only found in this area of South America, a nice clean band here, and this part of Africa. We could integrate over the surface, and the notation usually is a capital sigma, National Assembly, they create the Committee of Public Safety, which sounds like a very nice committee. Notice. This is an aldehyde, and it's an alcohol. Start differentiating into effector and memory cells. A galaxy. Hey, there's another galaxy. 
Oh look, there's another galaxy. And for dollars, is there 30 million plus the 20 million dollars from the American manufacturer? If this does not blow your mind, then you have no emotion. We now have uh, on the order of, of, of 2,200 videos covering everything from basic arithmetic all the way to, to, to vector calculus and some of the stuff that, that you saw up there. Uh, we have a, a million students a month using the site, watching on the order of 100 to 200,000 videos a, a day. Uh, but, but what we're going to talk about in this is, is how we're going uh, to the next level. Uh, but before I, I do that, I, I want to talk a little bit about really just how I got started. And, uh, some of y'all might know, about five years ago, I was an analyst at a hedge fund, and I was in Boston, and I was tutoring my cousins in New Orleans remotely. And I started putting the first YouTube videos up, really just as kind of a nice to have, just kind of a supplement for my cousins, something that might you know, give, give them a refresher or something. And as soon as I put those first YouTube videos up, something interesting happened. Actually, a bunch of interesting things happened. The first was the feedback from my cousins. They told me, that they preferred me on YouTube than in person. <laughs> and and, and once, once you get over the backhanded nature of that, I, there was actually something very profound there. They were saying that they preferred the automated version of their cousin to their cousin. At first, it's very unintuitive, but when you actually think about it from their point of view, it makes a ton of sense. You have this situation where now they can pause and repeat their cousin. Now they can, uh, without feeling like they're wasting my time, they could, if they have to uh, review something that they should have learned a couple of weeks ago or maybe a couple of years ago, uh, they, they don't have to be embarrassed and, and ask their cousin. They can just watch those videos. If they're bored, they can go ahead. They can watch it at their own time, at their own pace. And probably the, the, the least appreciated, uh, I guess, aspect of, of this is the notion that the very first time, the very first time that you're trying to get your brain around a new concept, the very last thing you need is another human being saying, do you understand this? And that's what was happening with the, the interaction with my cousins uh, before. And now they could just do it kind of in, 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 kind of, uh, in the intimacy of their, of their, of their own room. Uh, the other thing that happened is, you know, I put them on YouTube just, just you know, for, for the, you know, I was, I, I saw no reason to make it private, so I, I let other people watch it, and, and then people started stumbling on it, and, and I started getting some comments and some letters and, and all sorts of kind of feedback from, from random people around the world, and you know, these are just a few. This is actually from one of the original calculus videos, and someone wrote just on YouTube, it was a YouTube comment. First time I smiled doing a derivative. <laughs> and let's, let's, let's pause here. This person did a derivative, and then they smiled. <laughs> and then in response to that same comment, this is on the thread, you could go on YouTube and, and look at these comments. Someone else wrote, same thing here. I actually got a natural high and a good mood for the entire day. Since I remember seeing all of this matrix text in class, and here I'm all like, I know Kung Fu. <laughs> <laughs> And we got a lot of feedback along those lines. You know, it's clearly it was helping people. But then as, as the viewership kept growing and kept growing, I, I started getting letters from, from people, and it was, it was trying to become clear that it was actually more than just a nice to have. Uh, th this is just a, an excerpt from one of, one of those letters. Uh, my 12-year-old son has autism and has had a terrible time with math. We have tried everything, viewed everything, bought everything. We stumbled on your video de on decimals, and it got through. Then we went on to the dreaded fractions. Again, he got it. We could not believe it. He is so excited. And so you can imagine, you know, here I was, uh, 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 an analyst at a hedge fund. Uh, I, it, it was very strange for me to do something of social value. <laughs> so, I, I, I was, I was, uh, was. But, but uh, I, I was excited, so I kept going. And then a few things, other things started to dawn on me. That not only would it help my cousins right now, or, or these people who are sending letters, but it could maybe that this content will never go old, that it could help their kids or their grandkids. If Isaac Newton had done YouTube videos on calculus, I wouldn't have to. <laughs> uh, assu assu assuming he was good. Uh, we don't know. Uh, uh, 
the other thing that happened, and you know, even at this point, you know, I said, okay, maybe it's a good supplement, it's good for motivated students, it's good for maybe homeschoolers, but I didn't think it would be something that would somehow penetrate the classroom. But then I started getting letters from teachers, and the teachers would write saying, we've used your videos to flip the classroom. You've given the lectures. So now what we do, and this could actually happen in every classroom in America tomorrow, what I do is I assign the lectures for homework, and what used to be homework, I now have the students doing in the classroom. And I wanna, I wanna pause here for... I, I, I wanna pause here for a second because there's a couple of interesting things. One, when those, when those teachers are doing that, there's, there's the obvious benefit. There's the, uh, the benefit that now their, their students can enjoy the videos in the way that my cousins did. They can pause, repeat at their own pace, uh, at their own time. But the more interesting thing, and this is the unintuitive thing when you talk about technology in the classroom. By removing the one-size-fits-all lecture from the classroom and letting, and letting students have a self-paced lecture at home, and then when you go to the classroom, letting them do work, having the, stu the teacher walk around, having the peers actually be able to interact with each other, these teachers have used technology to humanize the classroom. They took a fundamentally dehumanizing experience, a bunch of th 30 kids with their fingers on their lips, not allowed to interact with each other. A teacher, no matter how good, has to give this kind of one-size-fits-all lecture to 30 students, you know, blank faces, slightly antagonistic, and now it's a human experience. Now they're actually interacting with each other. So once the Khan Academy kind of, you know, I, I quit my job and, and, and we turned into a real organization where a not-for-profit, um, the question is, how do we take this to uh, the next level? How do we take what those teachers were doing to their natural conclusion? And so what I'm showing over here, these are actual uh, exercises that I started writing for my cousins. Uh, the ones I started were much more primitive. This is a, a, a kind of a, a more competent version of it. But the paradigm here is we'll, we'll, we'll generate as many questions as you need until you get that concept until you get 10 in a row. And the, the, the Khan Academy videos are there. You get hints, the actual steps for that problem if you don't know how to do it. But the paradigm here, it seems like a very simple thing, 10 in a row, you move on. But it's fundamentally different than what's happening in classrooms right, right now. In a, in a traditional classroom, you have a couple of uh, uh, homework, homework lecture, homework lecture, and then you have a snapshot exam. And that exam, whether you get a, a 70%, an 80%, a 90%, or a 95%, the class moves on to the next topic. And even that 95% that, that student, what was the 5% they didn't know? Maybe they didn't know what, what happens when you raise something to the, to the zeroth power. And then you go build on that in the next concept. That's analogous to, uh, imagine learning to ride a bicycle. And I give you a bicycle, maybe I give you a lecture ahead of time, and, and I give you that, that bicycle for two weeks, and then I come back after two weeks, and I say, well, let's see, you're having trouble taking left turns, you can't quite stop. You're, you're an 80% bicyclist, so I put a big C stamp on your forehead. And then I say, here's a unicycle. <laughs> but as ridiculous as that sounds, that's exactly what's happening in our, in our, in our classrooms right now. And, and, and the idea is, you know, you, you fast forward and students start, good students start failing algebra all of a sudden and start failing uh, calculus all of a sudden, despite it being smart, despite having good teachers, and it's usually because they had these Swiss cheese gaps that kept building throughout their foundation. So our, our model is, Learn math the way you would learn anything, like the way you would learn a bicycle. Stay on that bicycle. Fall off that bicycle. Do it as long as necessary until you have mastery. The traditional model, it penalizes you for experimentation and failure, but it does not expect mastery. We encourage you to experiment. We ex encourage you to failure, but we do expect mastery. This is just another one of the modules. This is trigonometry. This is shifting and reflecting functions. And, and they all fit together. We have, we have about 90 of these right now. And, and, and you could go to the site right now. It's all free, not, not trying to sell anything. But the general idea is that they all fit into this knowledge map. That top node right there, that's literally single digit addition. It's like one plus one is equal to two. And the paradigm is once you get 10 in a row on that, then it keeps forwarding you to more and more advanced modules. So if you keep, so it keeps this further down the knowledge map, we're getting into more advanced arithmetic. Further down, you start getting into pre-algebra and early algebra. Further down, you start getting into uh, uh, algebra one, algebra two, a little bit of pre-calculus. And the idea is from this, we can actually teach everything. Well, everything that can be taught in this type of a framework. So you can imagine, and this is what we are working on, 
It's from this knowledge map you have logic, you have computer programming, you have grammar, you have genetics, all based off of that core of, okay, if you know this and that, now you're ready for this next concept. Now, that can work well for an individual learner, you know, and, and I encourage one for you to do it with your kids, but I also encourage everyone in the audience to do it yourself. It'll, it'll change what happens at the dinner table. Uh, but what we want to do is use the natural conclusion of the flipping of the classroom that those early teachers had emailed me about. And so what I'm showing you here, this is actually data from a pilot in the Los Altos School District, where they took two fifth grade classes and two seventh grade classes and completely gutted their old math curriculum. These kids aren't using textbooks, they're not getting one-size-fits-all lectures, they're doing Khan Academy, they're doing that software for roughly half of their math class. And I want to make it clear, we don't view this as a complete math education. What it does is, and this is what's happening in Los Altos, it frees up time. This is the blocking and tackling, making sure you know how to do a system of equations, and it frees up time for the simulations, for the games, for the mechanics, for the, for the robot building, for, for the estimating how high that hill is based on its, on its shadow. And so the paradigm is the teacher walks in every day, every kid works at their own pace, and a teacher gets, this is actually a live dashboard from Los Altos School District, and they look at this dashboard. Every row is a student, Every column is one of those concepts. Green means the student's already proficient. Blue means that they're working on it, no need to worry. Red means they're stuck. And what the teacher does is literally just says, let me intervene on the red kids. Or even better, let me get one of the green kids who are already proficient in that concept to be the first line of attack and actually tutor their, their peer. Now, I kind of come from a very data-centric reality, so we don't want that teacher to even go and intervene and have to ask the kid awkward questions. Oh, what do you not understand, or what do you do understand, and all of the rest. So our paradigm is to really arm the teachers with as much data as possible, really data that in almost any other field is expected if you're in finance or marketing or manufacturing, and so the teachers can actually diagnose what's wrong with the students so that they can make their interaction as productive as possible. So now the teachers know exactly what the students have been up to, how long they've been spending every day, what videos have they been watching, when did they pause the videos, what did they stop watching, what exercises are they using, what have they been focused on? The outer circle shows what the exercises they're focused on, the inner circle shows the videos they're focused on. And the data gets pretty granular, so you can actually see the exact problems that the student got right or wrong. Red is wrong, blue is right, the leftmost question is the first question that the student attempted, they watched the video right over there. And then you could see, eventually, they were able to get 10 in a row. It's almost like you can almost see them learning over those last 10 problems. They also got faster, the height is how long it took them. So, you know, when you talk about self-paced learning, it makes sense for everyone, you know, in education speak, differentiated learning. But it's kind of crazy what happens when you actually see it in a classroom. Because every, every time we've done this, in every classroom we've done, over and over again, if you go five days into it, there's a group of kids who've raced ahead and there's a group of kids who are a little bit slower. And in a traditional model, if you did a snapshot assessment, you say, oh, these are the gifted kids, these are the slow kids. Maybe they should be tracked differently. Maybe we should put them in different classes. But when you let every student work at their own pace, and we see it over and over and over again, you see students who took a little bit extra time on one concept or the other, but once they get through that concept, they just race ahead. And so the same kids that you thought were slow six weeks ago, you now would think are gifted. And we're seeing it over and over and over again. It makes you really wonder uh, kind of how much all of the labels maybe a lot of us have benefited from uh, were really just due to a, a coincidence of time. Now, as valuable as something like this is in a district like Los Altos, um, our goal is, is to use technology to humanize, not just in Los Altos, but kind of on a global scale, what's happening in education. And actually, that, that kind of brings an interesting point, is that you know, a lot of the effort in, in humanizing the classroom is focused on student-to-teacher ratios. Uh, in our mind, the relevant metric is student-to-valuable human time with the teacher ratio. So in a traditional model, most of the teacher's time is spent doing lectures and grading tests and, and, and whatnot. Maybe 5% of their time is actually sitting next to students and actually working with them. Now 100% of their time is. So once again, using technology, not just flipping the classroom, you're humanizing the classroom, I'd argue, by, by, a, fa by a factor of 5 or 10. And as valuable as it is in Los Altos, imagine what that does to the adult learner who's embarrassed to go back and, and learn stuff that they should have known before, before going back to college. Imagine, imagine what it does to a kid, a street kid in Calcutta, 
who has to help his family during the day, and that's the reason why he or she can't go to school. Now they can spend two hours a day and remediate or, 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 or get up to speed and not feel embarrassed about what they do or, or don't know. Now imagine what happens where, you know, we talked about the peers teaching each other inside of a classroom, but this is all one system. There's no reason why you can't have that, that peer-to-peer tutoring beyond that one classroom. Imagine what happens if that student in Calcutta all of a sudden can tutor your son, or your son can tutor that kid in Calcutta. And I think what you'll see emerging is this notion of, of a global one-world classroom. And that's, that's essentially what we're, what we're trying to build. Thank you. I've, I've seen some things you're doing in the system that have to do with motivation and feedback. Energy points, merit badges. Tell me uh, what, what you're thinking there. Oh, yeah, no, we, we have an awesome team working on it. It's not, and I have to make it clear, it's not just me anymore. I'm, I'm still doing all the videos, but we have a, a kind of a rock star team doing the software. Um, yeah, we've put a bunch of game mechanics in there. You get these badges, we're going to start having leaderboards by areas, and you get uh, uh, points. It's actually been pretty interesting. Just the wording of the badging or, or how many points you get for doing something, we see on a system-wide basis like tens of thousands of like fifth graders or sixth graders going one direction or another depending on what you know, ba badge you give them. <laughs> 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 and the collaboration you're doing with Los Altos, how, how did that come about? Yeah, no, Los Altos has been kind of, it was kind of crazy. They, they, once again, I didn't expect it to be used in classrooms. Uh, someone from, from their board came and said, oh, what would you do if you had carte blanche in a classroom? And I said, well, you know, I would just, every student work at their own pace on something like this. We'd give a dashboard, at, you know, and they said, oh, this is kind of radical. We have to think about it. And uh, me and the rest of the team were like, oh, you know, they're, they're, they're never going to want to do this. Uh, but literally the next day, they're like, can you, can you start in two weeks? And so, they, they <laughs> so it's fifth Fifth grade math is where it's, that's going it's, on it's right now? It's two fifth grade classes and two seventh grade classes. And I think they're doing it at the district level. And I think what they're excited about is they can now follow these kids. It's not an only in-school thing. I mean, we've even, you know, on Christmas we saw some of the kids were doing, and we can track everything. So it, they can actually track them as they go through the entire district, through the summers, as they go from one teacher to an X. You have this continuity of, of, of data that, that even at the district level they can see. So some of those views we saw were for the teacher to go yep. in and track actually what's going on with those, those kids. So you're getting feedback on those teacher views to see what they, they think they need? Oh, yeah. Actually, uh, most of those were, were kind of specs by the teachers. We made some of those for students so they could see their data. But, you know, we have a very tight design loop with the teachers themselves. And they're literally saying, hey, I, you know, this is nice, but I, like that focus graph, a lot of students, said, a lot of the teachers said, I have a feeling that a lot of the kids are jumping around and not focusing on one topic. So we made that focus uh, a diagram for them. So it's all been teacher driven. It's, it's, been, it's been pretty crazy. Is this ready for prime time? Do you think a lot of class, classes next school year should try this thing out? Yeah, it's ready. It's, it, you know, it's, uh, we, we got a million people on the site already, so we can handle a few more. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, no, no, no reason why, why it really can't happen in every classroom in America tomorrow. And the, the vision of the tutoring thing, the idea there is if I'm confused about a topic, somehow right in user interface, I'd find people who are volunteering, maybe see their reputation, and I could schedule and connect up with those people. Absolutely. And, you know, and this is something that I recommend everyone in this audience to do is you can, that, those dashboards that teachers have, you can go log in right now and you, could get, you can essentially become a coach for your, for your, your kids, your nephews, your cousins, or, or maybe some kids at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and yeah, you, you can start becoming a mentor or tutor uh, re really immediately. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's all there. Well, it's amazing. I, I think you've just got a glimpse of the future of education. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you. Okay. Okay.